So I would like to welcome you all to the third national conference of the US Network for Democracy in Brazil. This evening, my friend, colleague, and co-national coordinator, Gladys mitchell Wattauer and I will first present a brief overview of the work of the network, followed by a report from the national organizers, Marina Adams and Honey Vine, about some of the campaigns organized by the network. Finally, Juliana Moraes uh, Pinheiro, um, the uh, executive director of the Washington Brazil office, will share some of the activities of the office in the national capital. Uh, and this will take about 30 minutes so that the bulk of our time we will have to uh, listen to our keynote lecture by Paulo Abrão and a question and answer period thereafter. Tomorrow, we would like to invite you to afternoon sessions in one of six of the network's different working groups. We then will have six workshops being organized on different topics. And finally, we'll conclude the day with the general meeting to discuss the present and future work of the network. The work of the network has a long tradition in the United States. For more than 50 years, Brazilians and their allies in this country have organized against the violation of human rights and in defense of democracy in activities ranging from protests in the front of the White House in 1971 against torture in Brazil to mobilizations in support of Lula when he was charged with violating the National Security Act for leading strikes in the 1980s to the Brazil network uh, in the late eight, 1980s dealing with environmental labor and other issues to the Brazil Strategy Network founded in the early 2000s soon after Lula was elected president. In 2016, the mobilizations against the impeachment of Jim Rousseffi and opposition to the Temer and Bolsonaro governments marked the beginning of our current work. On December 1st, 2018, 200 people came together to found to found a decentralized democratic and nonpartisan national network with three points of unity. To educate the public about the current situation in Brazil, to defend progressive social, economic and political and cultural advances in Brazil, and to support social movements, community organizations, NGOs, universities and activists who would be vulnerable in the new political climate. We also presented a long-term goal of opening an advocacy office in Washington, DC, something we were able to achieve in February, 2020, after a su successful camp a financial campaign, a fundraising campaign with Juliana as our executive director. We currently have 1,500 members supporting our network and receiving our newsletter in 45 states. We also have the support among academic specialists on Brazil or Latin America in 234 colleges and universities across the United States. In October 2019, we held our second national meeting in Washington, DC, which included sessions, um, uh, working groups, workshops, and a general meeting to map out our work. People in California and in uh, Oklahoma also organized regional conferences. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the network structure, let me see if I can briefly explain it to you. The network relies on its 1,500 members, but more importantly, those more active who attend our meetings and engage in our campaigns. The founding meeting at Columbia University unanimously voted to establish a national steering committee composed of members of organizations affiliated with the network and representatives of working groups established at the national meeting. The steering committee has met monthly since January, 2019. And I'm honored to have served as the national co-coordinator since our founding meeting at Columbia University. In our se second national meeting held in Washington, DC in October, 2019, we agreed to invite Gladys mitchell Whitehower as our national co-coordinator. Marina Adams, a graduate student at Brown University, volunteered to be our national organizer and oversee other Brown students setting up a website and organizing an array of other activities, recruiting Juani Vine to serve in a key role in this work. And we need to give Juani a special recognition for the excellent job he has done throughout this last year, but especially in organizing this virtual conference. During the national lockdown, 
Gladys and I felt the need to call on several key activists in the network to form an advisory executive committee to help us think about strategic plans, which in turn, these ideas were then brought to the steering committee for their approval. And I wanna thank each and every member of the executive committee for playing that role. Finally, we were able to open the Washington Brazil office in February, headed by Juliana, and we uh, set up a, uh, an advisory board of people mostly based in the nation's capital who have expertise in congressional advocacy, advocacy to help oversee our work. And again, I'd like to thank the people on the uh, National Advisory Board of the Washington Brazil office for their service. With all of the challenges we have faced in carrying out the goals outlined in the network's point of unity, I think we can say that we've been largely successful. I wanna thank each and every one of you who have collaborated with our efforts from signing a petition, circulating a news item, donating money to setting up the Washington Brazil office, lobbying a member of Congress, coordinating a working group, attending our executive and steering committee meetings and organizing locally and nationally. I think we've made a difference through our collective work. And now I'm gonna turn the floor over to Gladys. Thank you. So um, first, I just want to thank everyone for being here. And I thank um, Jim for all of his hard work, Juliana, Marina, Pawnee, um, really everyone, um, both in leadership and then just members in general. Um, this has been a very rewarding experience for me. Um, so yeah, so thank everyone for all of their hard work. So what I'm going to do is, um, you probably noticed in Jim's PowerPoint, there was a little box showing the working groups. So I'm going to talk about those working groups. Um, and I, I haven't listed all of the activities, um, but I do just want to pull out some activities. So you kind of have an idea of some of the things that we have been working on. So the Afro-Brazilian rights group um, of which I am involved in and um, chair that one in 2019, we wrote a policy memo on the current status of Afro-Brazilians. And what we did is that I presented that memo at a briefing in Washington, DC, along with Sherelle Barber, who showed her excellent documentary on Marielle Franco. In 2020, we sponsored a webinar on COVID-19, racism and necropolitics in Brazil. Um, and some of the presenters were Dalila Negreros, Kia Caldwell, Chevrel Barber, and Felipe Freitas. Um, in 2021, the USNDB supported um, a number of panels, and one of those was one held at the National Black, the National Conference of Black Political Scientists. And we were very lucky that Anieli Franco um, was a panelist, um, and especially since that was in March. So um, it was along the time that her sister was assassinated, um, which gave us the opportunity to continue um, kind of talking about uh, or bringing attention to um, her sister's case. Also in 2021, the USNDB sponsored a panel um, entitled Who Ordered the Assassination of Marielle Franco and Others? Um, and this was a great opportunity, not just to talk about Marielle Franco's assassination, but also the assassination of other activists and politicians. Uh, Marina Santos from the MST served on that panel as well as Davi Pejeda and Chevrel Barber moderated that panel. The next working group is the health working group. And this is a new one that um, Miriam Marquez is leading Defend Democracy and she's from the group Defend Democracy New York. Also Mark Costa from Yale is um, also helping to, uh, to lead that group. The next group is the Indigenous Rights Working Group. This is another one that has been very active. Tracy Guzman of the University of Miami has led a number of um, activities and events. Um, and the working group also recently organized a Dialogos Pela Democracia episode uh, along with Christian Poirier of Amazon Watch um, with Sonia Guajajara. The Labor Solidarity Working Group. Um, 
So the USNDB Labor Working Group has been organized in the last year at the initiation and coordination of Stanley Gassett of the United Food and Commercial Workers Union and Jan Silverman of the Solidarity Center, AFL-CIO. The special workshop on labor takes, um, taking place during the USNDB conference is also intended to develop more interest in this area. So if you, you know, you see one of these working groups that looks like something interesting to you, feel free to join and we hope that you show up tomorrow. Another one of the working groups is the LGBT, LGBTQIA plus working group. Um, and this one is coordinated by Marcus Valera of Defend Democracy in Brazil, New York, and Guta Silveira of the Brown chapter of the USNDB. The LGBTQIA plus working group recently organized a meeting with leaders of queer groups in Brazil and is working on a document about the situation of LGBTQIA plus people in Brazil under their uh, current government. The religion working group is currently coordinated by Raimundo Bajeto of the Princeton Theological Seminary. The religion working group has built, is, is going to build ties with progressive religious groups in Brazil and the United States to, to offer an alternative voice about religion and social change in Brazil. Um, rural, the rural movements working group has largely been led by Gregory or Greg Morton of Bard College. Um, and he has coordinated the Rural Movements Working Group, which organized the event, um, Land Reform in the Pandemic, Brazil's Landless Workers Movement and U.S. Black Farmers in July 2020, um, as well as other campaigns for the MST communities in collaboration with, with friends of the MST. Um, I just wanted to focus on, on this event because it was fantastic. Um, and you'll notice that with a lot of these um, activities, you will see collaboration between groups in the US and, and Brazil. The US-Brazil Relations Working Group um, is led by uh, Rafael Iordas and uh, Jim Green in coordination with the Washington Brazil office. Um, and they have organized some meetings with Brazilian scholars working on US-Brazil relations. And they are currently planning a webinar with the Brazilian Association of International Relations on May 19th, 2021, entitled um, US-Brazil Perspective, Perspectives for the Environment under the uh, Biden administration. So we do welcome everyone to come tomorrow um, and go to some of these working group meetings. Thank you. Well, now um, I'll start off with our brief presentation on the national organization portion of the US network. Um, so thank you, Jim and Gladys, for the wonderful opening remarks and the generous introductions. Um, I think I speak on behalf of all of us when I say thank you to you two for all the work you have been do so diligently doing for the past few and a half years. Your leadership has been fundamental to getting us where we are today. Um, as Jim and Gladys mentioned, my name is Marina Adams and I'm the network's national organizer, a role that I have fulfilled since our foundation and will proudly pass on to Honey Wine over the course of our third national meeting as I continue on a new role in political advising and strategy implementation. The network's national organization is responsible for our day-to-day -day operations, strategy planning and implementation, and overall event allyship and communication efforts. We oversee a wonderful team of social media and website managers who work on developing our web presence and visual identity, further marking us as a source on Brazil and the United States. Gladys just spoke about the working groups that are part of the USNDB. Uh, besides the wonderful work done through those groups, each of our affiliated organizations gives body to the solidarity and grassroots work at the heart of our network. These, the, oh, sorry, our, the pictures of our team just went up. Um, these 30 and rising organizations are spread throughout the United States 
and are responsible for some of the most daring and impactful protests, campaigns, and events in support of Brazil's democracy. In this brief presentation, I'm going to highlight the work, the work of two such incredible organizations. And I truly could go on and on about all of them. And as you will notice throughout today's presentations and tomorrow's events, each of them has played a crucial role in getting us where we are today and shaping where we would like to go. So Defend Democracy in Brazil um, has been staging awareness raising actions such as protests, street performance, flash mobs, flying actions, academic events, um, and so many more uh, with the objective of calling the world's attention to threats to Brazilian democracy since 2016. They're one of our most active and engaged affiliated organizations. DDB has been crucial in the development of some of our national campaigns and fundraising. A strong pillar of our East Coast presence, DDB was at the helm of numerous manifestations, including the response to the US-Brazil Chamber of Commerce homage to Bolsonaro and Sergio Moro's visit to the United States. Moving to the West Coast, the Coletivo por um Brasil Democrático, Collective for Democracy Brazil LA, has been similarly fundamental to our activities at the national level. Founded, much like the network, in response to the 2018 election results, the CBPDLA thrives in forming both local and international connections. Besides its many political intervention in California, including protests, campaigns, and networks with local movements, the group has strengthened important ties with both Canadian and European organizations, illustrated in the immensely successful fan fundraising campaign supported by the network, which managed to raise around 140,000 reais to social movements and collectives working with communities disproportionately affected by the pandemic in Brazil. So these are just some of the things we have been up to in the past year. And I'm gonna turn over to Honi now, uh, who will henceforth be known as your new nation national organizer, uh, who will speak a little bit more about the highlights of this year's events, campaigns and productions. Um. Thank you, Marina, and uh, thank you to all of you who are here with us tonight. Um, as Marina said, uh, my name is Ronnie. I am uh, from originally from Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, and I'm also an undergraduate student in Brown University. Um, I've been working as the US NDB's communications coordinator since the beginning of 2020. And in this time, I've been able to assist and, and take part in, in many wonderful activities and campaign, which the US NDB either organized, led, or promoted. Um, to those of you who already follow us on social media, uh, will know that the USNDB is always glad to support the work of our members and allies, no matter if they take the form of an academic webinar, virtual or in-person demonstration, for example, and fundraising campaigns or other events. Um, reflecting on this past year, here are some highlights of what we've been up to. And um, it, it's also worth mentioning that as a matter of fact, one of our greatest strengths relies exactly in our ability to mobilize our members around the decentralized work that is done in the network, either through those um, collectives such as uh, DDB New York or, or the collective from LA. So we'd like to thank, um, thank you to all of you who over this past year submitted incredible events, meetings and webinars for our members and friends to attend. Your work as part of various academic institutions, centers, initiatives and other collectives Collectives is really invaluable to the USNDB. And um, so here are some of the events that we would like to highlight. Um, first, uh, it is important to mention that our affiliated organizations held two regional conferences this year, one in the West Coast in California and another in the Midwest in Oklahoma. Um, the USNDB is also very proud to have supported the seventh international symposium on history and, and hints on history and culture of Brazil at the Casa de Rui Barbosa. Um, together with WOLA, we, we uh, co-organized, um, WOLA being the Washington Office of Latin America, we, co we co co-organized the webinar Delusions of Grandeur, Bolsonaro and Trump's All Contra Deal and its impact on Afro-Brazilian communities. Um, in partnership with the University of Miami, we held a virtual lecture with Brazilian author and academic um, Conceição Evaristo. It was really a wonderful event. Um, we also were able to organize the Anti-Blackness and Democracy in Brazil and the USA webinar, which included law, law specialists, academics, and both um, Black Lives Matter and broader human rights activists from the United States and, and, and Brazil in the same meeting. Um, together with the University of Maryland, we organized a lecture called Vidas Negras Importam, uh, the struggle for black rights in Brazil and the USA. And um, we also, took part in or, or promoted or, or, or supported 
many other events um, I could mention here, for example, one of them were, was quite recent is the Burning Issue Symposium that happened at the University of Oklahoma, which was really great, um, but also many, many other events um, that were absolutely amazing this past year. As for campaigns in a broader sense, the USNDB is proud to every year organize a campaign in the memory of the life and activism of Marielle Franco. Uh, this year, the third anniversary of Marielle's death, the campaign was entitled, as Gladys mentioned, Who Ordered the Assassination of Marielle Franco and Others? And in it, we demanded answers to the assassinations of other Brazilian activists, mostly indigenous and rural, recently assassinated. Um, we, were, we are also proud to have supported the Brazil Solidarity Campaign, um, which fundraised for Brazilian social movements at the front line of the COVID-19 pandemic, and as Marina mentioned, raised more than 140,000 reais. Uh, we collaborated with UNEAFRO's immediate support to mar marginalized communities campaign, also amidst, amidst the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we joined a campaign supporting Quilombola communities under imminent risk of genocide in Marion. In Maranhão, we supported the campaign in defense of the Fundação Casa de Rui, de Rui Barbosa as the government attempted to dismantle it. Um, we led a grassroots mobilization against the eviction of an MST community at Quilombo Campo Grande, which was noted by local Minas Gerais uh, politicians and justices. And we also published the declaration against political violence in Brazil and in solidarity with Talira Petroni. Um, Finally, it is absolutely fundamental to mention Dialogues for Democracy. This is the network's interview show and is held and can be watched on our YouTube channel. On its first season, which was recorded and published um, over 2020, we had the honor to have great people um, coming to talk to us. Those include, as you can see, uh, Jean-Willi, Jurema Werneck, Sonia Guajajara, Maria, Maria Augusta Ramos, uh, Fernando Haddad, Douglas Bechior, representatives from MST Brazil. And we also held a special episode on the impact of the American elections of 2020 in the Brazilian elections of 2022. The show will return um, this year in 2021 for a second season, and we all have high expectations for it. So keep an eye open for it. Um, now I would like to invite uh, Juliana Moraes, the executive director of Washington Brazil office to take over and she'll lead us from here now. Hello, everyone. Just one second here. All right. So thank you so much, Jen, Gladys, Ronnie, and, and Marina. So I'll be talking about the Washington Brazil office, which is the advocacy arm of the USNDB. And for those who don't know me, I'm Juliana Moraes. I'm the executive director of the, the WBO. My presentation would be uh, including five different parts, our mission, who we are, the advocacy before the US Congress from a progressive perspective, the policy paper and its results and also the WBO's next steps. So the Washington Brazil office works on issues related to human rights and the environment in Brazil. Under these two big broad umbrellas, we seek to analyze undertaken policies, their consequences, and promote democratic debate towards social justice in the country. Our team is composed of myself, uh, two project assistants, Bianca and Iman, and as part of our communications group, Marta and Ronnie, who collaborate with us a lot. So the office started operating in February 2020 after one year of fundraising upon the launching of the USNDB. With the elections of Bolsonaro, there was a sense that the demands were going to raise, right, to be on the rise. And with that, we also realized the need to expand the work done before by, by our current allies, uh, like the Center for Economic and Policy Research, just, just Foreign Policy, WOLA, as it was mentioned before, the Amazon Watch, Greenpeace, and others. So as for our advisory board, we have five members of the academia, two of them who just spoke, James Green and Goddess, 
one member of the uh, representing the unions and three experts in advocacy and in Washington DC, one member of the third sector and another member who now works at Progressive International. So before I talk about the, what we have done so far, we need to take a few steps back and realize the importance of a relationship building from a progressive perspective or leftist perspective in the US Congress. Back in 2016, 43 members of the US Congress expressed their concern about Brazil's democracy in light of the impeachment process taking place against President Dilma Rousseff. Another action that, that was taken around that time was that a congressman took the floor to protest against the impeachment. So the latter and other actions, I'm just like giving these two big ones, there were other actions also, they were used in the defense of President Dilma uh, in August of that year in the Senate, and it was also broadly disseminated in the media. So since then, um, members of the US Congress have been defending Brazilian democracy, rule of law, human rights, and the environment. And, you know, from 2016 through 2018, before the office officially started, there were about eight public actions done by the US Congress. It's starting late 2018, during the election period and throughout the last two years, the US Congress members' concern has increased and over 20 public actions have been issued. And what do I mean by public actions? So there was a resolution published in, in September 2019, the Amazon, the Act for the Amazon Act, multiple letters and statements from multiple members and committees, both in the House and also the Senate, uh, tweets uh, in, uh, uh, in the invitation, which I'll talk a little bit more about, but the invitation of two Bra uh, American Congresswomen inviting three Brazilian Congresswomen to visit, um, and many other actions that took place. Here I'm putting a little picture just to show in March 2019 when Bolsonaro visited the, the nation's capital. Uh, there was a big protest in front of the White House and made to the front page of The Guardian sort of like remembering here the, the, the presentation from Jim in the 70s. We are pretty much in the same boat. So our work, um, our work since February 2020, we officially started the office with this big delegation of Brazilian Congresswomen, Fernanda Melchiona, Erika Kokai, and Joanna Apichana. They were both, they were, the three of them were invited by Deb Howland and Ilya Momar. And they had meetings with over 10 offices um, and also meetings at the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, the AFL-CIO, presentations in universities, meetings with the civil society, Black Lives Matter and others. So this, this is how we started shortly before the pandemic started. So another, another uh, result of this relationship building with the US Congress has been most of, of what you've probably seen in the news. Uh, we have maintained conversations with US members of Congress and in regards of the assassination of Marielle Franco, the, the death threats faced by Talire Petroni, uh, the, the need of the indigenous leaders from APB to have an open channel with the White House, um, and also a warning, warning the, the current administration how to, they can deal with Bolsonaro in face of the Amazon, Lava Jato and the Department of Justice and other many issues. So this is, is a way that we can create and, and collaborate with facts and, and denounce uh, all the setbacks taking place in Brazil and the US Congress with our allies in the Progressive Caucus. So why does this matter? Um, building a relationship with, with, the, with members of the US Congress from a progressive perspective takes time and dedication. And while we know that the right wing from Brazil has had space with conservatives for many years, it was difficult to bring progressives to pay attention to Brazil. And from the perspective of, a, I'm sorry, from the progressive caucus perspective, Brazil wasn't really a concern until 2016. 
it was then, uh, probably 20 years before that, that uh, we had to, you know, bring up what was taking place with the coup and impeachment process. Uh, what was taking going to take place in Brazil with this Pandora box open and what we're seeing now in 2021. So since then, we have been continuously working toward increasing these denunciations about the human rights violations, the environmental crimes, democratic breach before progressives in the US Congress. So I will talk a little bit more, I know it was mentioned before, but I will give more details about the policy paper submitted to the White House and members of Congress early February. So this policy paper includes 10 main points uh, from rule of law and democracy, climate change as indigenous rights in the Amazon, political economy, Alcantara space base and the technological uh, safeguard agreement signed by Trump and Bolsonaro's administration, gender and racial rights and the rights of those historically marginalized communities, labor, religious freedom, health and the COVID crisis, social movements, and a broad, a broad uh, set of issues in which we made recommendations uh, to, to the new administration. This document, it was published and had received a full media coverage in Brazil and a few other places too, including Deutsche Welle, Global Voices and a few others outside of Brazil. And with that, we, we have actual results I mean, results in the media, as you've seen, we were able to have a broad coverage, but also we had actual results that so far, there are two main ones. First, in February, 2021, there was a congressional briefing on climate change, environmental and indigenous rights, chapter two of the document. It was done with staffers from multiple committees, including the House of Foreign Affairs Committee and the Natural Resources Committee, we counted on the support of indigenous leader Sonia Guajajara, uh, Greenpeace director Daniel Brindis, and uh, human rights here expert Paula Brown, who is speaking a little bit. Uh, this briefing was really positive and it started open up channels for more conversations about this specific issue, especially now in April, lots of things taking place. Now in April, we had another congressional briefing focusing on the first chapter of the document, Democracy and the Rule of Law. It, it, it focused on the involvement of the DOJ with the Lava Jato operation. It included staffers from multiple committees as well. So as for our next steps, uh, we have many goals and aspirations. And for now, I'll resume in four. So we, we want to continue to attend to the demands as they come and also coordinate further briefings about the policy paper and beyond and opening this channel so that we can discuss those standpoints of the policy paper, go back to the, those two already, uh, already covered and continue this conversation in the US Congress. We want to continue also to connect Brazilian and US legislators. We know that in February, 2020, three Brazilian Congress women went there and we, they all invited American uh, Congress members to come to Brazil, but they haven't, they haven't been able to due to the pandemic. So far, there was some um, online uh, events in which they have been able to talk, and we are now connecting the agendas before members so that they can have a direct channel. There have been also letters sent from US legislators to, to the Brazilian Congress and vice versa, following up on various issues that I've mentioned before, including the Amazon and the land grabbers law, the attempt of the land grabbers law, um, and also the situation of Talide Petroni, the situation of the DOJ and Lava Jato and other matters. So the third uh, goal we have also is to seek the institutionalization of the WBO. The WBO right now is an incubator within the C within CIPR, the Center for Economic and Policy Research. Our goal now is to provide a, our own office and organization outside of it and continue to collaborate with our allies. For that, we need to build grounds for continuation for our work on a long-term basis. We plan to be working hard next year in 2022 for the elections, and we plan to continue the work aside from what might happen in 2022. 
Our goal is to continue the office on a very long-term basis and, and maintain the relationship with the Progressive Caucus. So I am here and I welcome anyone who wants to learn more about our congressional advocacy. To register tomorrow at 2.30 p.m., we're gonna be having a workshop and there are other workshops also for anyone interested to participate. Thank you so much. And now I pass the word for our keynote speaker, I'm Paolo gonna... Brown, the former executive sec secretary um, at the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Thank you and good evening.